tonight, nothing new, hopefully not new to you. Um, we have Miner's Day next weekend, next Saturday. Again, we will not be here that night. We will be out at Centennial Park. So we will have a booth out there um, sharing the Lord with those that walk by, handing out some goodies. Um, so don't come here next week. Uh, but if you do want to come and visit us out at the booth, please do. We'd love to see you. Uh, but we do need help. Again, we do need um, people to um, set up and tear down, people to, to man the booth, people to bring goodies for those that pass by, water, all that fun stuff. Um, and then prayers. We need prayer, right? Because we can't do this alone. We need the Lord's help. And so we need prayers too. Um, but if you do want to sign up, if you do want to volunteer and help us out, there's a sign-up sheet on the table out in the lobby just as you go out these doors. And if you do have any other questions, feel free to let me know. Um, and let's dive in. Let's dive in. Judges chapter 16. If you do need a Bible, we do have some out in the lobby on the table. I'd be happy to grab you one. Just need to raise your raise your hand. <laughs> All right, Judges chapter sixteen. Let's pray. Father, again we come to meet with you here in this place tonight. We have set aside our time to come and meet with you, to abide with you. May you abide with us tonight. May you speak to us as well. May you have a word for all of us. Because your word is powerful. And it changes lives. And so I pray, Lord, that you would speak to all of us. You would have a word for all of us tonight. Help us to hear what you have for us tonight. Open our ears and open our hearts. And it's in your great name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Judges, Judges chapter 16, look at verse 21. And the Philistines seized him, speaking of Samson, the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with, a, with bronze shackles. And he ground at the mill in the prison. Years after writing one of the greatest hymns of all time, Come Thou Fount, Robert Robinson wandered away. He was in a spiritually backslidden condition, and one day, Robert was traveling in a stagecoach, and there was only one other person with him, one other companion traveling with him, a young companion, a young woman, and both people were unaware of who each other were. But during their time traveling together, the young woman began to share how much of a blessing and an encouragement the hymn, Come Thou Fount, had been to her, even quoting, it, quoting, the, hymn to it, quoting the hymn itself. And try as he might, Robert could not get her to change the subject. <laughs> Robert could not get her to change the subject. She would eventually ask Robert what he thought of the hymn as she was humming it. And Robert responded, Madam, I am the poor, unhappy man who wrote that hymn many years ago. And I would give a thousand worlds if I had them to enjoy the feelings I had then. And gently she replied, Sir, the streams of mercy are still flowing. The streams of mercy are still flowing. Robert was deeply touched by what she said, and as a result of the encounter, he repented. And his fellowship with the Lord was restored. That's powerful. Robert, Robert Robinson fell. He backslid. He turned away from the Lord, distanced himself from God. But the words of this woman, her witness, and even his own hymn, was a powerful reminder to Robert that God wants to restore fellowship with him, a guy who messed up, a guy who backslid, a guy who fell. And despite what he was thinking, despite what we may think or feel, what lies we may hear from the enemy or this world, when we mess up, when we fall, it doesn't have to be the end for us. It doesn't have to be the end because God's not done with us. 
He's not done with you. God's word is going to be a powerful reminder for us tonight about that. That when we fall, that when we fail, when we backslide, we have turned away from the Lord, it doesn't mean it's the end. It doesn't mean it's the end. It doesn't mean that's where we have to stay. That God is done with us. Our journey ends. Or that it means your story ends at that point. It's quite the opposite. It's quite the opposite. Samson's story, his account is not finished in verse 21. Praise the Lord, it's not. Praise God, it's not. There is more. Samson was a man set apart for the Lord, but his service to the Lord was hampered by his sins that marred his life. Sins that would lead to his downfall. We saw this last week. His life of compromise, a life divided, dedicated to God, but lived for himself and the lusts of the flesh would eventually cost him his freedom, his strength. You could even say his ministry. And most of all, his relationship with the Lord. But thankfully, though, Grateful, gratefully, though, the story of Samson does not conclude there. It does not stop there. With him bound by his enemies, held captive for the rest of his days, his story does not conclude with him remaining in prison, bound by shackles. His story does not end with him remaining separated from God. No, Samson's story continues because God's not done with Samson. And God's not done with us either. And so even though we may fail, even though we do fail, it's not the end. It's not the end of the story. God's not done. He wants to bring us back. He wants to restore us and our fellowship with him once again, getting us back on the right track, if you will. Which will be evident in our lives, even something as small as a little bit of hair growing on the top of a head. Look at verse 22. It says, but the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. This is where we're going to park it tonight. <laughs> One verse. All right, that's how we do things sometimes. We take it nice and slow, and sometimes we take it really slow. Sometimes it's just one verse. Verse 22 for us. Last week in our study of this judge here, Samson, our last judge in this Old Testament book, we were witness to the results, the outcome of Samson's life being divided, this man of God dedicated to the Lord, but still, in, still living a life full of sin. And eventually the compromise in his life led to his downfall. Samson yoked himself with an ungodly woman, who we remember as Delilah. And she would eventually deceive Samson into cutting his hair. And as we said before, Samson's hair, his hair wasn't his source of power. His strength came from the Lord, his relationship with the Lord. And his hair was that outward reflection of that relationship, of his dedication. His commitment, his consecration to, the, to God. But Samson was willing to part ways with his hair. Samson was willing to let Delilah cut his hair. Samson was willing to abandon his relationship with God. And that's when this guy hit rock bottom. That's when Samson fell, and that's when Samson fell hard. His eyes were gouged out. His strength was gone. He was thrown into prison, bound with shackles, becoming the lowest of servants for the Philistines. He was disgraced. But as we've said previously, his story doesn't end there in verse 21. After that time, after this man of God fell, after hitting rock bottom, Samson's hair began to grow. His hair began to grow back, verse 22 tells us. And it's such an intriguing verse, this, this one verse is, though. Because what may seem insignificant at first, something we could just pass over, it's going to become more significant. It's going to be more powerful as we begin to understand the significance of this verse, what it means, why it's here, its implications. This is one of those verses I would highlight or underline in your Bible or mark however you choose. Make sure your neighbor does it too. But this is one we need to remember and implant in our hearts because this one we need to come back to. This one we may need in the future. 
one we may need to come back to. Because in those times when we fall, when you have hit rock bottom and found yourself in the darkness, and you think this is it, the Lord's done with me, we need to come back right here. You need to come back and see this. We need to come back and remember that Samson's hair began to grow and understand what it all meant. Maybe even rub your head a little bit um, in those circumstances. But Samson's hair began to grow again after he was shaved. Meaning the regrowth of his hair was symbolic of the restoration that was taking place between this man and the Lord. That sweet fellowship this guy once had with God. The Lord was restoring Samson to himself. Hmm. But why? Why would God do that? Because God is faithful. God is faithful. Samson allowed his hair to be cut, but God allowed it to grow again. Samson abandoned the Lord, but God did not abandon Samson. This is a verse we have got to come back to and be reminded of, because even though we are faithless at times, God remains faithful to us all the time. And he will remain faithful to you. He will remain faithful even to you. So do not fear, Isaiah. The Lord says in Isaiah 41, verse 10, he says, I am with you, be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And so even though we may not be able to see it, we may be able to feel it. We may be able to feel it, right? Samson's eyes were gone. He was blind. And even though he may not have been able to see his hair growing again, he could feel it. He could touch it. He could rub his head, right, after he'd been shaved and feel the hair beginning to grow again. He could feel God's faithfulness. Samson could feel the presence of God in his life once again. And even though you might not be able to see it, even though you might not <clears throat> be able to see it, God is still there. He will always be there. Just as he promised. Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 8, Joshua chapter 1, 9, Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5. The Bible tells us, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Even Matthew chapter 28 verse 20, as he sends the disciples out, what does he say? He says, I am with you always. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Through the highest heights and the deepest depth, God is there and he will be faithful to remain there. That's why this one little verse is so powerful. So powerful. Reminding us of who God is, through what God is doing, but we, we're not done yet. we still got two hours to go. Just kidding. <laughs> we're not done yet verse 22 not only shows us God's faithfulness his, in his restoration to us when we fall but his restoration also reveals to us God still has a plan for you God still has a plan for us Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 says for I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord plans for good and not for evil to give you a future and a hope there's no future, there's no hope without the Lord. There's not more to the story, but through restoration there is. Through restoration there is. Chapter 16 doesn't end here in verse 21. It continues, meaning God's not done with Samson. He has stuff he needs to do. He has a plan for this guy, which also means the Lord is not done with you either. And he has a plan for you too. A purpose, a future, and a hope. And when we fall sometimes, we tend to think or have that thought that the Lord can't use me anymore, right? I disqualified myself. But with God restoring Samson, <clears throat> it signifies that there's more work that needs to be done. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's more work that needs to be done. A purpose this guy still has. And we find that right here in this one verse. All right, verse 22 links verse 21 with the rest of the chapter. 
It's a bridge that extends to the rest of Stam uh, Samson's story. Samson's hair regrowing means God has plans for Samson. The Lord has more for this guy to do. God wasn't looking for someone else now. God was not looking for someone else. God didn't say, well, this guy or this gal is no good to me anymore. I can't use him or her. They messed up. God doesn't say that, but you know who does. Your enemy. Satan. The devil. He says those things. He wants you and I to believe that God is done with us. That the Lord is kicking us to the curb. And the sad part is, we tend to fall for it. You tend to fall for it. I've messed up, and now God's done with me. No, that's not true. I made a mistake. God's done with me. That's not true. Right? We need to see and understand the truth here. Samson isn't being kicked to the curb. He's being restored for service. He's being restored to serve the Lord again. To be used by God once again to accomplish God's will once again despite his failures. Even despite our failures. Though we may fail, it does not mean he is done with us. With us. Though you fall, it doesn't mean you will not rise again. Psalm 73 verse 26 says, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. How long? forever there's no end there's no end and even though we fail it doesn't mean God does it doesn't mean God has he is greater than our failures our mistakes our sin how do we know because Jesus conquered them on the cross Jesus overcame them on the cross at Calvary's hill he overcame them all of them for he is greater than all of our sin and our failures. And what remains is his grace and his mercy. The cross is a powerful picture of Christ conquering our failures and mistakes, the fall we took because of our sin, and replacing them with his grace and his mercy. We find that powerful picture here with, even with Samson. In his restoration, right? The regrowth of Samson hair was God's grace. The Lord didn't have to allow Samson's hair to regrow. The Lord didn't have to do that. Samson messed up big time. We've messed up big time. We have sinned. We should not be restored to the Father or receive everlasting life. Samson should not be allowed to have his hair regrow. He should not be restored. He shouldn't receive that. But it was through God's grace this man was being restored. Getting what he didn't deserve. That's grace. That's grace. And it was God's mercy that would cover Samson's head with hair, covering the sins of this fallen man, as the blood of Christ covers us from all of our sin and our shame. Instead of not getting what we do deserve for our disobedience. We deserve to be punished for our sins. Samson deserves to be punished for his sins, but he wasn't. He was shown mercy. He was shown mercy. But there's one more piece we need to see, one more piece we need to look at that is required here for us with this restoration that we need to draw from. It's that restoration is going to take time. Restoration is going to take time. Even though Samson was being restored, his hair was growing back, it was going to be a slow process. It was going to require time. For those that can grow hair on your head, unlike me, um, the average growth of human hair is about an eighth of an inch per week. That's roughly about six inches per year. And if you wanted to grow your hair to your waist, it would probably take you about six years to do that. But all that to say, this restoration of God is going to have to take time. If we have sinned and failed the Lord, fallen short, restoration is possible. It can happen, but it's going to be a gradual progression. 
We cannot expect to be restored overnight. You can be forgiven of sin in an instant, but restoration may take some time. Restoration shows us that we need more time with God. Samson had quite a bit of time there in that cell to spend with the Lord, to focus on the Lord. We are going to need that time too, just in a different location. But we're going to need to do the same. We're going to need that time, time in God's word, time in prayer, time in fellowship with his church, time with the Lord, focusing on him, worshiping him. After all, isn't that what led Samson to his downfall? He didn't spend any time with the Lord. He was more focused on himself. He spent most of his time on himself than he did the Lord. Time is crucial for us. And it can help or hinder our walk with the Lord. We're going to need time. And it's also going to take time to earn back the trust of others. Sin takes a tremendous toll on all the people involved. It takes time for the pain, the distrust, the effects of that sin to ease. Huge failures in our lives are not the result of a sudden fall into sin. They're a culmination of a long period of disobedience, as we have seen with Samson. But it takes time to replace bad habits with good ones. It takes time to change your, the way your mind thinks, how you view things. It takes time to change the way we live. And it takes time to earn back the trust of the people who have been wounded by our failures. And while sin might be forgiven and the sinner made right with God, forgiveness does not cancel out the consequences of sin. Forgiveness does not cancel out the consequence of our sin. Samson's hair grew back. But if you notice, as we read, continue to read later on, his eyes won't come back. Samson's hair grew back, but he was still bound. He was still blind and he was in prison grinding grain. Sin leaves a terrible mark on the lives of the guilty, and the scars sin leaves behind may never be fully healed. You must always try to remember that sin brings consequences. Sin has consequences. Consequences that may follow us the rest of our days, even limiting us from certain positions in the church, even certain positions out in the world. Right? It's not that we don't forgive or that the Lord does not forgive. The issue is that people will not follow a leader in whom they have no confidence. Or businesses may not want to hire someone with a felony in their background, but no matter the background we have, no matter what we have in our background, no matter what mistakes we have made or crimes we have committed or sins we have fallen into, the depths we have reached, we have a powerful reminder for us tonight here from Samson's life. And your story is not over. Your story is not over. It doesn't have to end when we fall. Because God wants to restore us when we do fall. God wants to restore us when we do fall, when we do make those mistakes, when we fail. Because he wants us to rise again. God's not done with you yet. And that's a powerful reminder. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, again, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. Gosh, and what a powerful reminder this one verse is for us. It is for me. That when we stumble and we fall, we make mistakes. We wind up where we shouldn't be. You're still there with us still ready to restore us and bring us back. Gosh, how gracious you are to us, how faithful you are to us, how wonderful you are to us. We can just see your heart towards your people, towards us in this one little scripture. So I thank you for the love and the grace and the mercy that you have for us. And I thank you that we can celebrate that tonight with communion. But please, Lord, go before us. Guide us. 
Help us to spend our time, more of our time with you, not for ourselves. And when we do fall, when we do mess up, bring us back here. Bring us back to this one verse and how Samson's hair began to grow. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, it is communion tonight. Evan's going to pass around the elements. But hold on to them. Don't take them yet. We'll take them together. But grab one and hold on to it. We'll take it together. All right. Let's all watch Evan. <laughs> all righty. <clears throat> so we get to close our time tonight celebrating and remembering communion. We get to close our time tonight remembering another powerful message. A very powerful message, a message that saves lives. It saves the soul. Right? The message of Jesus and what he did for us. So we get to remember that tonight. The sacrifice that our Lord made for our sins and the grace and the mercy he shares with us. So that we could be restored to the Father. That we could come to the Father. And we can be restored with him. So on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, took it in his hands, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which has been given to you. Take and eat of it. Right? The bread symbolized his body being broken, being torn apart for our sake, for your sake, so that you would have life. And our sins would be forgiven. So, Jesus, we thank you for your broken body. We thank you for your sacrifice and the grace you show us through your sacrifice. That it should be there, us up there on that cross. It should be us up there thrashed and beaten and torn, but it was you. Thank you for taking our place. Thank you for giving your body in our place. Go ahead and partake. And again, on that same night, Jesus took the cup, passed it around, and said, This is my blood that has been shed for you. Take and drink of it. And the Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Without Christ's blood, sin is not forgiven. But Christ did share. Christ did bleed for us. Washing us white as snow, washing us clean. His grace was greater than all of our failures and all of our mistakes. His blood did that. His blood washed us clean. So, Lord Jesus, we again thank you for your blood, your whole life that was given for our sake. To restore us to the Father and redeem us from our sin. How precious how precious your blood is to us, and we remember that tonight. Go ahead and partake. All 
right. So we do have some light refreshments as you head out. Feel free to stick around. Um, but if you do need prayer, feel free to reach out to me or grab the one next to you. Make sure their Bible is highlighted on verse 22. Um, well, that's worship.